Good morning, everybody. If you can't see the TV, come in close. I won't bite. If you can't see the TV, come in close. Everybody good? Can you see the TV? Nope. Mm-hmm. All right. Sounds good. Uh, okay. Anybody guess what we're talking about today? Uh, a Highline. A Highline. I would love to talk about a Highline, <laughs> but no. We are going to talk about Oak Wilt. Um, who in here thinks they know what Oak Wilt is without cheating and looking at this? <laughs> a few hands. Can you describe it? Anybody? It's a disease. A fungus? It is a fungus, yes. Anybody else? Why does it kill oak trees? Spray. Master arborist? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. It basically it, it chokes the tree from the inside, right? Um, so we're gonna go through. Uh, this is a OSU article. Uh, written, I forget, like several years ago, uh, maybe 2019 over here. I think that might be it. Um, but still very relevant uh, about oak wilt. Does anybody in here not feel like this is the first time they're hearing oak wilt? No, that's, that's a good thing. <laughs> um, this is, this basically vascular disease is why we don't prune oak trees unless we have to in you know, for what, like April 15th to about October 15th-ish, depending on the growing degree day. Unless you're working on another Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're gonna, we're gonna read through this article together. Um, I've got some questions for us, uh, and that's what we're gonna be discussing today. So, without further ado, who wants to read first paragraph on the screen for me? Mac? Mind kicking us off? <clears throat> oak wilt is a serious and often deadly vascular disease of oaks. The fungal pathogen, Bretzelia, is that how you pronounce that? I think Bret so. Bret Bretzelia? Vagacerium, formerly Ceratocystis Vagacerium, is known to occur in North America, but its origin is currently unknown. The pathogen is distributed throughout the Midwest and Texas. Over the years and with variable frequency, it has been reported from the majority of the 88 Ohio counties. All right. Has been reported from the majority of the 88 Ohio counties. That means it's here and it's here to stay. Okay, thank you, Mac. Who wants to read the next paragraph? What the pathogen does. <laughs> <laughs> the fungus grows into and throughout the water conductive tissues, that is, the sapwood of the host. The fungus plugs the vessels with its own body, mycelium, and spores, but also causes a defensive reaction by the tree to stop the fungal spread by actively plugging its own vessels. These processes interfere with the water uptake and cause a wilting syndrome, which often results in the death of the tree. Yes. Does everybody understand what that's saying? Right? Basically, the fungus causes spores uh, and, and basically plugs the vessels inside the wood to keep it from transpiring water from the roots to the leaves and vice versa, right? So, everybody in here know what emerald ash borer is, right? Killed a majority of the ash trees, at least around here. Does very similar thing, but affects you know, the, the cambium from boring in and, and basically disrupting it physically. Uh, okay, thank you. I know we're throwing this mic around. Who wants to read the next one? Susceptible oaks. Don't be shy. Hendrix, you mind? <clears throat> susceptible oaks. All oaks are susceptible. Those in the red and black oak group, black, blackjack, pin, northern and southern red, scarlet, shingle, and schumard oak are extremely susceptible and die within a few weeks of infection. Oaks in the white group, burr, chinkapin, post, swamp white, and white oak, are more tolerant of the disease and may survive infection for one or more years while displaying decline symptoms. Mm -hmm. 
So pretty much every oak tree is, is susceptible to this. That's, that's a majority of the oaks, especially around here, um, that are native to Ohio. Does anybody know why the oaks in the white group are a bit more tolerant of the disease? Any wild guesses? Yeah, definitely, definitely probably part of it. Um, the majority of it has to do with, if you can see this over here on the right, this open and closed cell structure. Red oaks, at least in the red oak family, have an open, what they call an open cell structure, right? That means you can, sh you know, basically when they get plugged up, that's gonna be a, a, a more drastic change to, you know, the system of the tree, whereas the white oaks are already closed, not closed, but more closed, I should say. Um, so it's gonna be harder for the fungus to fill up uh, those, those little cells and, and choke the tree. Does that make sense? Super, super scientific, I know. But that is uh, the layman way of describing that. Uh, okay, diagnostic symptoms. Andy Smith, you mind? <clears throat> we'll just keep going down the line. Symptoms are typical of wilts. Leaves usually begin withering in the upper canopy, producing flags, that is, whole branches or crown portions turning red-brown. Leaves of red oaks typically show yellowing or browning of the leaf margins. White oak leaves usually show rather nondescript symptoms. Confusely, live oaks in the southern United States produce characteristic dead areas along the leaf veins. These dead areas generally expand until the whole leaf becomes brown. Eventually, the leaves fall from the tree. If infections occur in late spring, trees usually begin wilting in mid to late summer when the plants often are subjected to water deficient due to increased transpiration demand and decreased rainfall. Yeah. All right. Who here feels like they've seen oak wilt in Columbus? Maybe half a dozen of us? Yeah, where at? Uh, Joe's farm. Joe's farm, yeah. Yeah, yeah where else? Sunbury, yeah, kind of that upper, upper northeast quadrant of central Ohio. Anybody else feel like they've seen it? I feel like this question depends on who you ask, definitely. <laughs> um, no, but do the symptoms that we read about, do those make sense? Like if you look, I know it's hard to see this picture, but looking here, you, know, you see a lot of leaf dieback. Like leaves are still clinging onto the branch, right? But you've got major, major what they call flagging, where it's just like, boom, something is going on and these leaves are actively dying uh, in the upper, upper crown. Um, then when you look at the figure three, that leaf is exhibiting uh, what they're talking about with that, that symptomatic dieback of the leaves. And I think it's important to remember that this, is a, this happens very quickly, you know, and especially with oaks and a red oak group over a matter of just a few weeks. So when mm -hmm. folks are saying, hey, my oak tree's been dying for years and I think it might have oak build, mm -hmm. you know very quickly that's probably not the case because this is a very fast yeah. moving disease that will yeah. an oak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but maybe, yeah, maybe ask him, you know, is it in the red oak or the white oak family? <laughs> okay, uh, this second half of the symptoms. Ben Henderson. <clears throat> A specific and sufficient diagnostic character is the appearance on dead and dying red oaks, but not white oaks, of spore bearing fungal mats under the desiccating bark. These fungal mats crack the bark open with pressure pads to facilitate dissemination of the pathogen. Sapwood streaking is also a good but insufficient diagnostic character in all cases. However, conclusive diagnosis can only be made in specialized laboratories such as the Ohio State University C. Wayne Ellett Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic. Other factors, factors other than uh, C. fagacerum can cause similar symptoms, so proper disease diagnosis is critical. 
Among these factors are drought, construction damage, and insect attack. Other diseases, such as some wood decays and anthracnose, might be confused with oak wilt symptoms. For sure. Everybody like that OSU lab plug in the OSU article? Um, yeah, has anybody here actually seen the fungal mats of oak wilt? I've never actually seen them in person. Have you seen them? Andy, anybody? No? Yeah, I haven't actually seen, like this, this is what they're talking about here on the bottom left, these, these like pressure pads under the bark. Um, I haven't actually seen them. I do know like if, if we really suspect that a tree does have it, we'll take a, a tissue sample and go and have it checked. Uh, do we take it to this lab or do we take it elsewhere? But now we've got to send it to the, the that lab is no longer accepting samples. Oh, okay. And uh, I think for personal reasons, so we send it to a lab in Worcester, which is still affiliated. Yeah, the yeah, no, for sure. Okay, so th those are the symptoms. Do we have questions about the symptoms of oak wilt? Like TJ said, if this is a red oak or something in the red oak family, like it, it will basically kill the tree in a matter of weeks to maybe a month or so, right? So this is why this is so important to know about, but also important to know, you know, is there anything we can do about it? Could trees get both oak wilt and hypoxylon canker? Like if it's sudden death with an oak wilt, like could a hypoxylon move in after that tree is dead? So yeah, hypoxylon canker is I would a, imagine a, so. a secondary, uh, or a secondary disease that shows up on oak that are already in severe stress. So it wouldn't surprise me to see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, that is a good point, Harry, because both of them, I think, are kind of, both of them are definitely not helped when the tree is in a season of drought. Yeah. And they both show up as like some sort of, you know, physical, like, like of what you're used to seeing on the bark, so I can see you yeah. mistaken those two. For sure, for sure. Not, not to say that hypoxylon is, is a good thing either, <laughs> but... <clears throat> Okay, disease cycle and conditions favoring the disease. Who are we at next? I think Mitch, I think you're up. In order to properly manage oak wilt, it is essential to understand its cycle. The pathogen spreads from disease to healthy trees in two ways, overland and underground. Overland spread is mediated mainly by sap feeding, such as picnic beetles. However, there is some evidence that oak bark beetles may also be involved. Wow. <laughs> Nidodilids sure. are attracted by chemicals emanating from the fungal mats described above. Once on the mats, the beetles pick up fungal spores and can carry them, sometimes over distances of a few miles, to freshly wounded healthy trees attracted by the smell of fresh sap. This results in new infections, thus closing the overland cycle. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's pause there for a second. Oh, hold on, hold on, Todd. One second. Um, okay, so it says overland spread is mediated mainly by sap feeding beetles. Um, <laughs> Nitidulids, maybe? Attracted by chemicals emanating from the fungal mass described above. Um, you know, they pick up these fungal spores, carry them to freshly wounded, healthy trees, thus creating a cycle of how this uh, pathogen uh, moves from, from a, a diseased tree to a healthy tree. So, when we are pruning or removing oak trees, are we dealing with the above ground or the below ground aspect of oak wilt? Uh, above, yes. So, that's where we mainly focus on, especially if we must prune or remove, you know, for storm damage reasons or something like that, an oak tree uh, or a branch or a section of oak. Um, that's why we have the pruning paint. Um, that's why it's so important for us to have that. That's why it's important for us to get out there in a timely manner, uh, as we'll learn when we read on through here. Next. Yeah, Tom, hide, hide under the gravel. While insect spread is an important medium to long-range dispersal, dis, dispersal mechanism 
for this fungus, it is estimated that 90% of new infections occur between neighboring trees through root grafts. In this case, the fungus grows down the trunk into roots of diseased trees and then into healthy trees via the common root system. Once in new trees, the pathogens grow throughout the vascular system and spread to other trees via the root system or the beetle. In this way, spread throughout root systems often result in disease centers that expand outward from the initial infected tree. Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you, Todd. It is estimated that 90% of new infections occur between neighboring trees through root grafts. So how much percent does that leave us to worry about picnic beetles? 10%. Oh. <laughs> 10%. Good job. Good job. Yes, 10%. So, I, you know, and I'm not trying to minimize, you know, the above ground transmission of oak wilt, but 90% is a lot of percent for underground spread through root grafts. Um, it is, oh, go ahead, TJ. I just want to make one comment that yeah. I had a talk on mm -hmm. oak wilt from a, a Cleveland forester. Yeah. And they were having problems with oak wilt and their, and their street tree removal program where they would have a, a dead oak that had died for other reasons. Mm -hmm. And they would remove it to ground level before they had an opportunity to grind the stump. The stump was exposed, it would attract all these beetles, it would come to the stump, and then all of a sudden from root grafts, it would be sending the, the disease to all the neighboring trees. And yep. So even though we're working on the above ground, which for the tree we are facilitating the below ground movement very quickly yes. in that scenario. So even when we're, we're, we're moving an oak now, we also want to spray the stump. Yep. Because it's highly likely that our stump grinder won't be on site for at least five business days. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that that is, that is absolutely a great well, you said that great was point. To make it clear. You only want to hit the outside of that stump. You don't want to <laughs> spray the entire stump. But it's, it's pretty painful. I'll spray the entire stump. Okay. Uh, unless you want to be an artiste. <laughs> well, I think it depends yeah. on the size of the stump. Also, I mean, if you've got a young tree, I would spray the entire stump. For sure. If you have a stump that's the size of all four of these barrels. You're going to go through a lot of printing paint really, really quick. <laughs> You're making a lot of excuses over here. Uh, no, those are both really, really, really good points. Um, to that end, yeah, and, and I think maybe, I think in the next paragraph or so, it talks about how if you're going to remove a tree with oak wilt, that, that has oak wilt, confirmed oak wilt, um, once you remove a tree, you know, that basically acts as like this siphoning effect to where all of the water and the resources get pulled out of those roots. Um, and if it's got oak wilt in it, those are going to go with it into neighboring oak trees that may or may not be grafted to them. So, uh, okay. So starting with from the above, we'll finish this section. Who's up next? Someone over here. Angel. <clears throat> From the above, it follows that conditions favoring disease include the availability of susceptible oak species, tree growing close to each other, and the availability of fresh wounds for beetle meditate infection. Pruning wounds are obvious cold spreads, but any fresh wound will fun function as a potential infection getaway. The word fresh is in phase emphasized because it is believed that wounds are active to needle? The beetles. The beetles <laughs> only for up to three days. As with many plant diseases, or stresses, for example, drought can pre predispose, predispose trees to faster symptom de development and, and thus worsen the syndrome. Yes, thank you. Yeah, so like TJ was saying, 
It says the word fresh is emphasized because it is believed that wounds are attractive, attracted to, well, attractive uh, to nitude, oh geez, the Beatles, <laughs> only for up to three days. Why might these wounds only be attracted to the Beatles up to three days? Sap stops flowing, exactly. Yeah, after three days, things are just gonna start drying up. You know, they may not be nearly as attracted to uh, those, those now not so fresh wounds. Okay, does that make sense? Anyone have any questions so far? No, all right. Uh, real quick, so if you can look, if you can follow my cursor on the TV, uh, these are the nitidulid beetles, or easier to say, picnic beetles, right? Is it? If you can see those, has anybody actually seen these beetles in person? They're not super uncommon. Yes. That I don't know. Are are the I'm going to call them picnic beetles. Are the picnic beetles the same beetles that spread Dutch elm disease or help spread? Yeah, I don't know if, if they are. They may. They're they mm -hmm. the main beetle that the folks you know, worry about. Uh, you know, it's typically elm bark beetles. Mm -hmm. so, you know, but I don't want to say this now because I'm really not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I, I would imagine they might be like a secondary host. But, yeah. Display. While we're on that topic, I mean, Dutch elm disease works exactly the same way as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Like, there are several diseases. Yep. I also just want to mention, yeah, does anybody understand or who feel like they have a good grasp of, of how the, the printing paint helps? Like, like what is the purpose of putting it on the tree? Why mm -hmm. are we doing that? Does it help the tree heal faster or good question. more quickly? No, that's mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. okay. I am completely against using printing paint <laughs> in all uh, scenarios with the exception of printing oak. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because it really, a lot of research has been done to show that it slows down the natural compartmentalization mm -hmm. process in the trees. I mean, <clears> some <throat> of the ingredients on, on some of these products you know, are like asphalt and terrible things that I would never want to put on my body. And so mm -hmm. the whole point of using it is to make the wound less attractive yeah. to the beetle. Yep. That's all it does. So, you know, I just, a lot of nurseries market it as like something healthy that you should put in the trees in your <laughs> brand. That is not the case. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Asphalt. Yep. Uh, Bodhi, I think maybe next, the control management of the disease. The best control for oak will is through preventative measures that in, uh, interrupt the disease cycle. <laughs> Overland spread can be hindered or interrupted by ensuring that the trees are never wounded between April yeah, uh, between April 15th and July 1st. This is when most beetles fly to locate fresh sap and or fungal mats. A more stringent strigid approach is to avoid wounding the trees um, throughout the growing season. Since additional summer flights of the beetles are possible, if pruning is absolutely necessary during the uh, growing season, it is imperative to dress the wounds. This can be done with latex paint although this slow wound healing it will also deter beetles from landing on the wounds yep thank you so yeah so again just like tj said you know it is imperative to dress the wounds with some sort of what they're you know they would say is a latex paint you know we use a pruning paint it's kind of got a petroleum-y asphalty kind of uh ingredient list to it definitely not the nicest thing in the world to use um but it's, al it's almost a, a lesser evil, right? This will slow wound healing, but it will also deter the beetles from landing on the wounds. You know, do you want to slow the wound healing or do you want the tree to get oak will? What's that? Neither one. Neither one, ideally, yeah, yeah. Okay. Next section. Prevention of underground spread. Remember, this is 90% of how this disease spreads. 
Yeah, get in, the, get in there. <laughs> Given the higher significance of underground spread control of direct tree-to-tree -tree transmission, it is much more important. Here, interruption of the disease cycle is accomplished by physically severing the actual or potential root <coughs> contacts between diseased and healthy trees. This is done by trenching and cutting through the soil with a trencher or vibratory plow. The latter is the preferred tool given the depth of the oak root systems. It is advisable to use a five foot blade, figure eight. Trenching must always be done before the diseased or dead trees are cut for removal, see below, to avoid sudden water tension imbalances that might suck fungal material from the infected trees into the healthy trees through the common root system. Trenching should be conducted <coughs> by the advice of specialists. This is due to the importance of locating the trenches appropriately between the diseased and healthy trees. When possible, a double trench defining a buffer band of apparently healthy trees between. Sorry. <laughs> I can read it on my paper. Diseased and <laughs> uninfected trees should be used. Figure nine. On residential or commercial properties, always determine the location of buried utility lines, which may affect the ability to completely sever the graft. Furthermore, walkways, paths, and roads should also be considered appropriately as tree roots commonly grow under them. Due to all of these potential obstacles to proper trenching, it is advisable to undertake such operations under the supervision of tree care professionals with expertise in the management of oak wilt. All right, let's pause there. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Harry. That was great. Okay. Is underground prevention of oak wilt an easy task to accomplish? Definitely not. Also seems super destructive. Right? So let's, so, okay. Can everybody see this figure eight, right? This is a, I could only assume a, a trencher or vibratory plow. Yes, um, to, <laughs> to, to find a machine that, a vibratory plow rather, uh, that has a five foot blade on it, that is not a small machine. No. That is a very large machine. And if you can imagine setting that machine in the front yard of a Worthington house and telling them we're gonna cut all of the roots to five foot depth around this oak tree, and not cut anything else. My invisible fence. My, yeah, my invisible fence along with my sprinklers, my, sprinklers, my electrical, my gas lines, you know, fiber optics. Like five feet, that, that is a deep, deep, deep trench, right? I would imagine a five foot blade would probably hit bedrock in most areas before you even get to that point, at least around here. But uh, that being said, using some sort of trenching tool to sever those roots, as destructive as that might be, is the recommended route to go if you are adamant about doing so. Uh, practicality of this, <laughs> not super practical, especially in an urban setting like we are. Maybe, you know, outside of town, Tascula on a farm, probably definitely going to be easier to do. Um, but inside a really, really urban setting, this is going to be rather difficult uh, to accomplish, let alone difficult to convince the homeowner that it should be done. Not convince, but at least educate them on, right? I don't think we've ever. I, I, I'm that. I yeah. think you've <clears throat> removed. Mm -hmm. I, I, asked, I asked Joe this question yesterday if we had ever done anything like this. He said that, I think, he said we be, he believes we came close once, maybe seven or eight years ago, to doing this. And it never, like, went through the entire process. Like, we never, we never accomplished this, but there was at least the planning stage of trying to figure out how to do it. I think they make that attachment to the road out. Yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that wouldn't be a bad, bad way to do that. Uh, yes, um, the little footnote, there is currently no evidence that the blade will spread the pathogen, however it is good precautionary practice to spray the blade to run off 
uh, between trenches, between plots, uh, with an antiseptic such as Lysol or a 20% bleach solution. On that topic, what are other things that we should be disinfecting after use? Hand saws. Hand saws. Chainsaws. Chainsaws. Why? Yes. Yes. That's probably one of the most overlooked things in the ARB industry. All right, questions about prevention of underground spread. It's not a perfect system by far, right? If you can create a perfect system, you should talk to someone. You can make a lot of money. Disposal of dead or, and dying trees. Once the trenches are in place, disease and dead trees should be removed as soon as possible by cutting them down to leave a two to four inch high stump. Because diseased trees with bark tightly attached may produce or harbor fungal mats, they should be disposed of, prop, of promptly. Uh, they go on to basically describe how those fungal mats can still be under the bark of a higher stump, thus still being susceptible to spreading oak wilt. Uh, further on, it says, good precautionary practice suggests avoiding the use of infested chip mulch around healthy oaks. If you're gonna chip them, don't just dump the chips next to a healthy oak because they might still be uh, infected. What's that? Thappy. Thappy, yes, they might still be thappy. Chemical treatments. Chemical treatments are usually not warranted due to the high cost of intervention. Trenching, chemical application, maybe. Uh, systemic, it says later on, a little bit further down, systemic fungicides have been demonstrated to be effective, particularly when applied as a preventative treatment. The only scientifically tested systemic fungicide showing any efficacy and labeled for use against oak wilt is propiconazole, available under the trade name Alamo. Which we do do. I was gonna, say, I was gonna ask, yeah. 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 No, definitely. Um, and the, the last section basically says uh, chemical treatment will not, however, rid an infected tree of the pathogen. Right. It's a very, very, you know, preventative major uh, application. Okay. So I know that was a lot of education packed into 30 minutes. Does anybody have questions about oak wilt? Actually, let me ask this. Does anybody, anybody in here feel like they learned something about oak wilt they didn't know before we started? I see a majority of hands. That's good. That's the point of these, right? Um, so again, just to kind of summarize oak wilt, definitely, definitely, definitely will kill oak trees through basically choking them from the inside. Doesn't allow water and nutrients to get from the leaves to the roots and uh, vice versa. Um, all the oak trees, at least around here, are susceptible to them, or to oak wilt. Uh, you'll see flagging uh, and leaf dieback rapidly in trees that are susceptible to it. But to be sure that oak wilt is actually what's going on with that tree, and it's not just drought or some other stressor, uh, a tissue sample is definitely a viable way of getting it tested in a lab for that. So. Can you talk about like, what a proper sample looks like? Mm, good question. Uh, maybe TJ, you can correct me if I'm wrong. A proper, a proper tissue sample for an oak wilt thing. I, would, I think it's supposed to, you're supposed to have what is like at least a branch that's half inch or larger? Is it, is it one inch? I really don't know. No, okay. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, and they just want woody tissue. They don't want just like a, a big long so when, thing of leaves. When we were taking it to uh, Brownsburg out there, yeah, they wanted the whole tree if we could take it out there. Really? They wanted like the As, biggest. The more, the more, the better. That you could take out there. That way, they could select their sample. Unfortunately, no. we can do that. Um, they also wanted it as fresh as possible. They. I don't know the scientific side of it, but mm -hmm. there was a certain way to test for it, and then they got a new machine that there was like a different way to test for it. it yeah. One allowed for, you know, it to be within a 12-hour window, and one allowed it to be within like a multiple day mm -hmm. um, 
window. I don't know what Booster has at this point. So freshness is important um, and kind of like actively dying areas. Yeah. You know, as far as sizing, <clears throat> you know, the bigger the better, but we can only mail so much. For sure, for sure. At this point, we have to ship it overnight to allow yeah, some cotton to Booster. Why go so big? Yeah. Whole tree. <laughs> No, that's a great question. Anybody else have any oak wilt related questions? Going once, going twice? No? Um, just to clarify, Corey? it's the reds that die fast and the whites that die slow. I would say generally, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, don't ha I don't have any experience or evidence to say otherwise, but according to that article, yes, because, because of the cell structure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Just red oaks. Yep. Any mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. That's going to conclude our discussion on oak wilt.